You really don't want me to play, huh? No, I do. Captain Howdy said no. Captain who? Captain Howdy. Who's Captain Howdy? You know, I make the questions and he does the answers. Oh, Captain Howdy, yes. Yeah, nice. Oh, I bet he is. Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello. This is Wait, You Haven't Seen. It's a show where we talk about movies and specifically, we talk about a movie at least one of us never seen before. I'm your host, Travis, a.k.a. TV's Travis. This is episode number 260 and our movie this week is 1973's The Exorcist. And here to talk with me about it because he had not seen it before. It's the senior geek, Gary. Gary, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, How you been? Uh, Very, very good. Uh, Busy. Busy. It is uh, coming up on, uh, I'm going to a conference here soon for Warhammer, and so I have been furiously painting miniatures uh, for uh, hours on end for the last few days because I procrastinate with the best of them. Oh, uh, Well, I'm recently retired, so I now have time to watch movies that I never got to before. So There you go. So, so I watched this uh, two-hour-long movie that should have been 90 minutes at least, at most. But anyway, <laughs> So the question first is, how is it you hadn't seen that? You're, you're obviously familiar with it. It's kind of impossible to escape The Exorcist in at least a passing knowledge of that. But how is it you never saw it? Are you, a, are you much of a horror movie fan at all? I'm not really much of a horror movie fan. Okay. Uh, I think you put up a list of movies the other day, you know, asking who had seen what. And uh, I haven't seen, well, uh, what's the found footage one? Uh, Blair Witch. Oh, right. I haven't seen that. Have no interest in it, <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I wasn't interested in it when it first came out. And uh, as time went by, there were always other things. And I do remember at one point there was something that I thought was The Exorcist on HBO, and I didn't have anything to do one afternoon, and I put it on. And after I finished realize reading or watching it, whatever I did to it, it uh, turned out to be one of the many, many, many uh, remakes, sequels, Got whatever. It. So I hadn't actually seen the original one. All right. And, uh, you know, normally it, I don't get somebody who was around when a movie came out, depending on how old it is. But you were actually, I mean, you would have been how old when this came out? Uh, I would have turned 24 that summer. Okay. So, and you just, you just had no interest in the movie at all, but were you familiar at all with kind of the, the hype around it and maybe some of the hysteria? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that was back, you know, when everybody was getting super excited about everything, uh, got into the eighties and you had, uh, you know, satanic fever, and right. all that. So, so, you know, it, it didn't really surprise me at that point. I was pretty much still a hippie. So. Okay. Yeah. So that makes sense. I'm not really into the horror scene. I, yeah. I buy that. Um, I wasn't going to a whole lot of movies then either. So, So okay. So you watched this for the first time, and uh, I, I have a feeling based on your comment, kind of how you felt about it, but your comment of a two-hour movie that should have been an hour and a half. So what did you think overall just sitting down and watching The Exorcist based on sort of you know, what you had heard about it. And I mean, how did it, how did it seem to, to you watching this now? Uh, one of the surprises for me was the makeup job on uh, Max von Sydow, uh, right. the, for 1973, because I, uh, he's always been one of my favorite actors. And the fact that I didn't even recognize him in the first part of the movie in Iraq or wherever it was, mm -hmm. And I got halfway through the movie and I said, wait a minute, is Max Foncino in here? <laughs> and, uh, um, and so, uh, you know, I looked it up and I actually found a before and after picture of, because he was only 44 at the right. time and he definitely looked to be in his seventies. So that was a pretty good makeup job. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I just, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, uh, the internet age. I, the, the very, very, very slow development of the plot. I know they're, they're building suspense and mm -hmm. all of that, but uh, I, I didn't think it, uh, I mean, I've watched old episodes of Rockford Files 
and you know they, they'll have like a five minute scene of somebody driving down the street and you don't right. see that anymore yeah for yeah. sure oh yeah um on the subject of the makeup job for max von Sydow, that was one of my notes and that's one of the things i always take away from this was he convincingly looks like he's in his 70s there and right. for for me I, it's funny because i've seen him in so many things and i love him in so much but i always think of him as being 60 70 years old because i think of this movie and then i think of the the more recent stuff that i've seen him in the the um cameo he oh, had he in, in star, star wars yep uh yep. um you know stuff like minority report even like where he was he was finally in his 60s and up um because this makeup job was just so convincing and then you realize oh no he was like 44 when this came out he was you know still fairly young man so yeah um well and uh, go ahead oh uh no go, i was you, just gonna say ellen birkin i i, I was having thought you know ellen birkin i think was born looking 40 years old and then i looked it up and she was 40 years old when this was, <laughs> uh, was filmed so uh that wasn't surprising uh, yeah the only other thing I've seen her in was same time next year with Alan Alda. Oh, right. Uh, that I can recall. But yeah. Um, and she's fantastic in this. Ellen Burstyn is really convincing oh, yeah. to me. I, everybody, I think, in this cast really nailed it and may, and was, was convincing in what they were going through. Um, right. Nobody. And we'll talk kind of what they did with for Reagan um, or uh, in a little bit, just kind of the combination of actors and things that that went on to make that performance. Um, mm -hmm. But but Ellen Burstyn, um, uh, Jason Miller as Father Karras. Uh, right. He had been acting on stage uh, prior to this, but this was his first film. This was his first credit uh, in any kind of film or television was this movie. And he was nominated for an Academy Award for his right. performance. Um, and but he's just, I don't think he did a whole lot after that. He looked kind of familiar to me, but uh, he did a little kind of, bit, but a lot of his yeah. career, um, he did, uh, a lot of stage work. He preferred stage work. And so mm -hmm. he did more of that. He was in a few movies, including actually returning as father, uh, Karras in the exorcist three. Um, but it's a, which was hard to do cause he was dead. Yeah. It's a confusing <laughs> way that it happened with another, a different possession. Yeah. Um, but he's also uh, the father of Jason Patrick. And uh, uh, not sure who Jason Patrick is. He uh, he did quite a bit in the um, uh, he was around in the 80s. I think he was in the Lost Boys, if I remember right. But he was in the 80s and kind of 90s. He's been acting for a while. Um, but Jason Miller, his father. Um, yeah. He also is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, playwright. He won. He uh, won for a play he wrote the year before he was in The Exorcist. So he, he did a lot of stage work, uh, but he's just great in this as, cause he's kind of really outside of uh, the mom, Chris and Reagan, he's the main character. He's the, uh, like the other, there's kind of two stories going on at once. There's mm -hmm. everything going on with Reagan and then there's Father Karras and sort of his- um, I'm Feeling guilty that, uh... I, I, I wasn't clear what happened. Did he pull his mother out of the hospital and put her back in her home and then she died there or did she die in the hospital? It, it was not clear. Yeah, it's me. it's and a little muddy exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But yeah, he's dealing with that that guilt and sort of this crisis of faith he's going through and, and his position as a, both a priest but also a psychologist um, has him dealing with a lot of different people, which I'm sure makes it even harder for him um and yeah and you know you throw in the stuff that's going on with his mom who that his mom was played by a greek actor who had never been in a movie before either so a lot of kind of oh, first okay. timers in this um uh we mentioned max von Sydow. lee j cobb plays lieutenant kinderman um yeah i had to stop and say he looks familiar who the heck is he and, and then oh, oh lee j cobb of course yes uh one of his last movies actually he he passed away a couple years after this came out um and yeah. in the so this is based on a book and in the book his characters a little got a little bit more to do um but he's really good in this too because again it's the believability right like he's the cop that sort of there's something going on but he doesn't really understand what and he's trying to figure it out 
but he and and he never comes right out to ask his questions. I kind of like that about Kinderman. He's always like dancing around stuff with people and trying to like yeah, kind of feel them out. Kind of doing the uh, I'm having a senior moment. The uh the, the guy that as he's walking on it, oh, oh, just one more question. Yeah. Uh, uh Columbo. Uh, he was Columbo. That's yeah. So uh um yeah, I, 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 I was having a hard time telling if he just wasn't a very good cop or, you know, just a nice guy or if he, uh, uh, yeah, you know. So, I mean, there are a bunch of things about this movie that, that were, I just wasn't sure what was going on and what it was supposed to symbolize. And, uh, but, and I think I know, I'm on the spec, I'm on the spectrum. And if you don't spell something out for me a lot of times, it's like, okay. And, and a lot of that is there's intentional vagaries in this. So, so as I mentioned, this was based on a book. William Peter Blatty wrote the book, The Exorcist, and I think it was published in 71 or 72. Um, and then okay, it got optioned. So it was pretty new at that time. Yeah. And it got, it was, it was wildly popular, got optioned to make a movie, and he wrote the screenplay. So the author of the novel wrote the screenplay. Um, and then he worked with William Friedkin was the director of this. Friedkin had just done the French connection, uh, prior to this. Yeah. And which I did um, see when it came out. So, well, there you go. So, um, well, and, Popeye Doyle. uh, and so there were some changes made from the book to the screen version, most of which was kind of Bill Friedkin playing up more. So the book is a little bit more ambiguous of, is she actually possessed or is it, more psychosomatic um and uh and sort of the 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 questions around that um because there is a thing in the book where she has reagan has a book on witchcraft that they find mm. and um there's a lot more that dives into sort of the psychology of it and like her dealing with her parents divorce and kind of all of that stuff and it's still very much a possession story but it's a little bit more ambiguous about it. And Friedkin thought, well, we got to play more into the visuals of this. And so he yeah. uh, wanted to go that route. So they actually, they butted heads a little bit. And there were some things that uh, ended up getting cut that did get later put back in or alluded to. Um, most of which was, um, there's the conversation at the end with Lieutenant Kinderman and the other priest, uh, Father Dyer. Um who kind of shows up early on and then he comes back at the end. He's the one that goes up to Father yeah. Karras. He uh, actually played by an actual priest, William O'Malley. Um, he was the technical right. director and then they cast him to be Father Dyer. Um, so there was a conversation with those two about the movies that I think was originally cut from the theatrical version. Mm -hmm. And um, basically the stuff that got, a lot of the stuff that got cut with some of the character work and later on Friedkin and uh, Blatty came together and they made, they, he added in back in a couple of things. There's uh there's also the, did you, the version you watched had the, uh, when she walks down the staircase, spider walks down. No, no, it, no? it was okay. missing that. Uh, so, um, I think I watched it on, uh, prime. Okay. I, I, I read it on Amazon Prime, so whatever version they have there. So that was a thing that got cut out that they put back in in like 1999. Uh, this movie got yeah. a re-release. I think it was 99. Um, but yeah, it was just little things like that. So they butted heads a little bit, but um, I kind of like the idea of, because obviously every time you take a story and you put it to a new medium, you do have to adapt it. And so I think in a book yeah. form, the more ambiguous nature of everything works a lot better on the written page as you're reading it. Cause you're developing all of the imagery in your head. But when it comes to a, a film show us stuff. And so they added in the stuff. Well, like, like in, in, in ready player one, uh, the task that he had to perform wouldn't, wouldn't have filmed very easily. Right. And so, uh, so they, they gave a different, more, you know, film friendly task to do. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say, I can't remember what either one of them was, but similar right. similar idea though yeah yeah and so there were things added in like the levitation isn't in the book right um a lot of the furniture moving around still happened. well if they were if if they were leaving an ambiguous as to whether or not she was having a psychological breakdown or was actually possessed you know you couldn't have any physical manifestations manifestations right like that yeah 
So, um, or they'd have to be very subtle. Yeah. So like they had in the book when, when stuff would get moved around, like the furniture, it would all happen when mm-hmm. Reagan was alone, like the door would right. be closed and they'd open it up and stuff would be moved. And that way there's the, the doubt of, did she move it or did it move on its own? Whereas in the movie, we obviously see the dresser move on its own or the drawer open up or her levitation. So, but I did like how in the movie it's still, I like the slow burn nature of it, but I understand. And it's the biggest criticism that I hear when people watch it for the first time, or I talk to somebody who maybe didn't see it until later on is it just moves so slow and it's, it's two hours long. And I get that completely. Well, and I, I think it's just because entertainment nowadays is a, nowadays is a lot faster paced. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you, do, you don't have, as I say, uh, a 90 second long, uh, you know, uh, scene of somebody pondering while they're walking down the sidewalk to set a mood, you know, you, you're just like, bam, 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 bam. These mm-hmm. things. Cause <laughs> I think we're losing our, our attention span. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, now I, I love slow burns. It's kind of why I like Kubrick and, um, also guys like, uh, David Lynch do a lot of that stuff where they really, they let, a scene or a shot sort of linger and marinate a little bit. And Friedkin would do that here. And I think too, it's, it's a very slow moving story, right? Because we spend, it's a two hour movie and we spend an hour and 20 minutes of that where she's not really ever actually possessed per se. And it's a lot of questioning of it and sort of setting that up. Um, but for me, yeah, I was kind of curious as to when. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, when from, did the possession actually? Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So for me, I like the slow burn of it because I think what it does is it sets up caring about Reagan and about her mom and their their relationship, and we spend enough time with them that when things really go south, um, it matters. But I would say that uh, to your question, when the possession took place. It starts kind of at the beginning of the movie by the time, it, but it's, um, it's a slow process. So in, right. in demonology, uh, which when I was younger, I did a lot of paranormal stuff. Uh, I was really into it. I listened to a lot of things like that. And one of the things they talk about in that is the stages of uh, possession are mm-hmm. going through depression first and mood changes and it's a slow thing that wears down over time till you get to full blown possession. And so that was one of the things I think the movie does show off pretty well because you've got Reagan who the beginning of the movie, she seems like a normal kid. She's fine, but she's already been mm-hmm. messing with the Ouija board and talking about captain Howdy and all of that. Yeah. And by the time she's at the doctor, it, uh, there's subtle things they did. I captured some audio we'll play later that uh, is one of those things where like they, they did a little thing with her voice or they start talking about different behavior. And what you what you get is it compounds and it ramps up over time until finally it just hits the top point and she looks like Linda Blair in this movie and spit and pea soup and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I love that. I like that slow burn, but fully understand that like you, it, part of it is that you're just like, come on, get to it. Let's go. It's an hour. I'm an hour and a half into my two hour movie and I haven't, you're going to have an exorcism in your exorcism movie type of thing. Uh, and was, was the possession was the, the, the medallion. Was that, uh, how the possession was transferred? And in that case, you know, where was this demon in all the time between the time the guy was in, uh, in Iraq and, uh, or Iran, wherever the heck he was supposed to be. And uh, when they got to Washington, D.C. So, yeah, they never they never give you that info. Right. It just sort of happened. She it just happened to be her. And this movie did, uh, I think, really feed into what became the satanic panic in the 80s and especially around Ouija boards. Right. Which were, you know, they're, they're just a toy. But this movie, I think, fed a lot of the because I know when I was growing up, Man, I better I, I I better not have touched one of those boards because my mom my mom uh, was not a fan of those, and I'm pretty sure a lot of that oh. is from this movie. 
Um, I played Dungeons and Dragons in my 30s in the 1980s, and I had devout Christian friends that were fearing for my souls. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it is very vague on, like, how did that happen? Because the, the beginning of it, which is a rock um, that he's in, and it was actually funny, uh, Freakin had to get a whole British film crew to go film those scenes because yeah. at the time the U.S. had no no relations to get in there, so he couldn't couldn't bring a U.S. film crew over. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there like that basically just gives us Father Marin and where he came from, but we don't know enough. We don't know anything about what happened between then and um, you know how the how the demon which is never named in the movie, uh, but is named mm-hmm. later. I think in one of the sequels, it's Pazuzu is the name of the, yeah. the demon. Um, yeah. I listened to the film sack uh, um, episode ah, on yes. this. And uh, yeah, they, 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 they named the demon Pazuzu. And I wondered how they knew that, but. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting that we don't get that. It just sort of happened um, to this girl in Georgetown uh, for, you know, yeah. randomly. Um, but uh, they bring in father Marin and they bring in, uh, and father Karras. And I like that too. Cause this sort of set up the trope of the, you know, I need a young priest and an old priest, um, mm-hmm. which I always think of. And then I realize, Oh, it's just because father Marin was the only person that had done an exorcism. And father Karras was the one that knew the family or knew enough to be there and wanted to be, you know, be part of it. Um, so yeah, I, it's it's interesting to me. Um, I did read, and this is kind of cool. This was the first horror movie nominated for an Academy Award for Best Picture. Yeah, that's that's what I heard too. It, it so. did not win. I don't think um, it won. No, I don't remember what won that uh, year. But it did. I mean, it had. Oh, it won two Oscars. Oh, it won an Oscar. So William Peter Blatty won for Best Adapted Screenplay, which got to kind of love that. The, the screenplay author wins the best adapted screenplay for adapting his own novel. Um, that's, yeah, well. But I guess it, uh, the best person to adapt it is the one that wrote it, so. <laughs> um, it also won best for best sound. The Godfather in 73. Oh, well, okay, yeah. Anyway. That's, uh, I get that. <laughs> I can see how yeah. that won over, over The Exorcist. Although it's pretty impressive to be nominated for Best Picture for, you know, what is, it is a horror movie. Um, uh, best Sound was the other yeah, thing. It so, uh, so adapted screenplay yeah. and sound. Well, one of the other things that, and I, I had to, you know, cast my mind back to like the early 70s, mm-hmm. but the amount of smoking that went on <laughs> in this picture. Yeah. It was like, uh, I live in Southern California right now, and uh, smokers are definitely in the minority. And uh, it was just, you know, everybody was lighting up a cigarette every time, uh, you know, there was a scene change. And uh, especially, well, especially for somebody who's a boxer, who's who's running, yep. and uh, he finishes running, and then he lights up a cigarette. It's like, really? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that was how it was. And you can always tell a movie is, I would say, pre- I don't know, 1990 uh, or maybe even 1985 when doctors are smoking too. Right. Which I, well, I had to write that down. I, I love that. I have in my lifetime, uh, I had moved, so I had changed doctors. And so I went to get a checkup with a doctor and the entire time he was working on me, he had a cigarette smoldering, smoldering in an ashtray. But that, <laughs> that would have probably been circa 1977 78 so it was uh very odd yeah i mean that's just how it was back then smoking in hospitals and uh, apparently, on planes apparently priests drink a lot too so yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i suppose if you if you were going through the stuff he was you might drink a bit too um so so I, I I was interested though in the progression from her just messing around with uh, a Ouija board and Captain Howdy, um, and uh, and then you know slowly but surely it getting worse and worse. Mm-hmm. And at first you could you know fool yourself into thinking ah oh, she's just a troubled kid you know needs some psychiatric yeah 
Yeah. So that, that, that was an interesting progression. Uh, the, the one thing I thought though, was, you know, when they got to the end, I didn't realize that, uh, uh, an exorcism was so much work. <laughs> you know, yeah. How, 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 how many times do you have to yell at the demon? The power of Christ compels you. Before... <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think that scene that that section of that scene gets longer every time I watch the movie. I feel like they add yeah. another one in every time I see it. Because you're right, it just keeps going and going and going. Um, it's no wonder Father Marin died. He just he was tired. He was like, "All right, I'm done." He's an I'm old done. guy. Had a heart attack. So, um, by the way, they uh, they refrigerated that set that they that they shot all that stuff in it was like i was wondering that when when you could see their breath mm -hmm. i was saying well there's there's no way that you know that, there was no cgi back then so they had to actually have been in a very very cold room yep oh uh, yeah it, in order uh either that or they were smoking a lot <laughs> well that too but no they had the room at like 40 <laughs> degrees i think or something like that it was one mm -hmm. of the things so William Friedkin was kind of known, especially at this time, for being a bit, I'll be, I'll be kind and say um, uh, loose on his sets. Um, borderline dangerous in some ways. Uh, if, you, if you remember the car chase at the end of The French Connection, um, he shot all that yeah. without permits and without staging. They just drove down the street oh. really fast. Yeah, that seems dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it was. And a lot of those those near collisions were not stunt cars. They were just cars on the road. Yeah. Um, some, some poor guy driving to work and all of a sudden <laughs> here comes you Gene got a Hackman. car with cameras all over it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but he did some of that here too. So he and Jason Miller got into a bit of a, a kerfuffle um, on set because – Friedkin wanted to get a specific reaction out of him um, and actually fired a handgun into the ceiling, like right next to his mm. ear or something, nearly nearly causing him to lose hearing. Um, Ellen Burstyn was actually injured. So the there's the shot where um, Chris gets like thrown back and she lands and you see Ellen Burstyn kind of mm -hmm. grab at her back and scream right mm -hmm. before the, the big chest of drawers comes at her. Yeah, that was... Um, right. The, uh, she was hooked up to a harness and they, right. they had people on the yeah, rope and they pull her. Um, yeah. They pulled her. She had been telling them, don't pull too hard. And Friedkin basically told the stunt guys, go ahead and yank as hard as you can. And so she fell and like seriously injured herself uh, mm. from that. Um, so he was a little, he would get. Uh, kind of go a little too far. Stuff that wouldn't fly today on a movie set. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, getting the... Well, I mean, now, pretty... what it did was it got good performances. So it's kind of one of those yeah. things. It's like, uh, I, I understand what he was going for, but at the same time, you got to find a better way to do it there, bud. Um, but, you know. Well, speaking of things that wouldn't fly today, the uh, the, the film director that got drunk... Was it Blake something? Oh um, yeah, Burke. Burke, Burke something. Uh, and uh, earlier, uh, the girl had, I think it was the same character, has suggested uh, that she and uh, uh, Ellen Birkin's uh, character get married. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so so that was the same character. Yes. Uh, but uh, but I mean the way he treated the, uh, the, the butler or the handyman, whatever he was, it was, it was terrible. And, you know, and, and, uh, and Ellen Burstyn's, you know, Chris, you know, yells at the butler, you know, to get out. And I think she just wanted to get away from, but then, you know, they're sending him out the front door and ha ha, wasn't that, you know, that's just, uh, yeah. uh and yeah, no, no, that, no. You can't do that kind of stuff. No, and I think my note was actually like, yep, uh, drunk dipshits at parties, a tale as old as time. But but he went like, I forget that too. Like I forget about, I, I remember him making some comments, but then when he keeps going with it and he, he's in the, the yeah. kitchen with him 
um, and all of that. Yeah. And it's like, oh man, no, you just can't do that. And you certainly don't laugh it off after the fact at all. Well, and, and then apparently he got thrown out of the window mm-hmm. and I don't really understand the physics of that. Cause it looked to me like that window was at least 15 or 20 feet away from the top of the stairs. You'd have to really pitch somebody to get him to go down those steps. Yeah. But, uh, um, but my first thought was, you know, drunk uncle, uh, in the room alone in the house with a 12 year old girl, uh, you know, maybe he deserved <laughs> what, maybe, what he got. <laughs> um, yeah, actually it's funny. The, uh, so the house they shot at in Georgetown, um, for the exteriors and the, the steps does exist. You can go there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. In, in reality, that window is like 40 feet from the steps. And so there's just no way you're going to fall ah. that. Um, but they did. Or, or jump because. Right. They did try to build, yeah. Yeah. I think, an extra. They, they put a bit of a set extension they built off um, to get it a little bit closer. Mm. But, yeah, there's some little little hand waving. It's fine. He, he made it. It's supernatural. She's. Right. The, the demon possessor, she's super strong and can throw him out. But then, you know. Then you get uh, Father Karras uh, at the end who jumps out. <laughs> well, and that, that, you know, he had supernatural strength there you himself go. at that yeah. point. So. Um, but, and if you just ask a demon to take you over, he, he goes for it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, I think it's that, that's, that is definitely the hand wavy bit at the end there. Uh, yeah. I mean, of all of them is that he's able to do that. Um, but, you know, uh, at that point, I kind of let it go. Like, I've yep. suspended my disbelief enough. Um, I can give it one more step. Well, and it was early 70s. We, yeah, I don't think we had quite as high expectations for en- entertainment. Well, we also didn't then. have yeah. possession movies. This kind of started right. the possession movies. And now, you know, you get, um, there's a lot of them out there. And there's probably my favorite outside of the exorcist is one called the exorcism of Emily Rose. And it was directed Mm -hmm. by Scott Derrickson. I want to say it's 2006. It's got Tom Wilkinson in it. It's similar in premise where you've got a young girl who is possessed, but they're not sure if uh, it's real or if she's having medical issues. The difference is it's half possession movie, half courtroom drama because the, the father in this Tom Wilkinson's character is on trial based on a wrongful death suit involving the girl. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a really interesting take on it. Uh, and, and obviously the exorcist crawled so that movie could walk. Um, but yeah, this, this really started the kind of possession movies in general. I think, I mean, there had been, I'm sure something along the lines, but like true on full on, like here's a possession and we're going to try and exercise because exorcisms weren't, widely known at the time from what i understand mm-hmm. like it wasn't it wasn't so like today you can talk to just about anybody and most people because of this movie and the and the subsequent sequels and remakes and spin-offs and parodies and all of that people know what an exorcism is but i don't think it was nearly as commonly known uh, at the time that this came out in fact i did read that the studio wanted to change the title because they didn't think anyone would know what an exorcist was or understand what it meant uh, well, and another thing that I noticed that I thought was interesting was that Father Karras' first name was Damien. Yeah. And I don't know if that name had the association that it did at the time. Well, Rosemary's Baby came out in 1968. And I believe the baby's name was Damien, if I remember correctly. I've never seen the movie, not into horror. but I know Damien was in The Omen, which I think was a couple years after this. The Omen was 76. So that might be where a lot of the association with Damien maybe came from. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. it is funny that he's Damien uh, Karras or Dimmy. That's my, f- I love that, uh, that diminutive form uh, when his uncle is talking well, I, to him. I kept getting Joey, I kept getting Joey Tribbiani vibes from him. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I like that. Um, Linda Blair, by the way. Uh, who did get an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, Ellen Burstyn got for... No, she was only 12. Yeah. 
Uh, Ellen Burstyn, um, Jason Miller, and Linda Blair did. Now, there was controversy around Linda Blair's nomination because after she was nominated, um, it came out that uh, actress Mercedes McCambridge did the vo- the vocal work as the demon. Um, mm-hmm. And there were also some stunt actors that did a few things. The spider walk I mentioned was one, but uh, but some of the stuff on the bed and some of the the things that were going on were uh, stunt person made up to look like uh, Linda Blair. But because of the rules of the Academy, they couldn't take her nomination away, so she was nominated. She kept the nomination um, anyway. But the combination of all of those made for an incredible performance. I mean, Linda Blair at 12 years old is really good throughout the whole thing. Um, yes, yes. Well, and when she comes down to the party and pees on the rug, they kind of left a Chekhov's gun on the mantelpiece there because she told the astronaut he was going to die. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess it, it happened over a fairly short period of time. But, you know, if he'd burned up on launch or reentry or something like that, it might have, you know, it, it, it was just, yeah, as I say, Chekhov's gun. <laughs> and I wonder, because the book takes place over the course of months instead of kind of yeah. the few weeks that the movie does. So I'm I'm, tr- I'm trying to remember if that happened. That might happen in the book. I'm not sure um, in terms mm. of like the astronaut. That, by the way, my note there was uh, you have all these drunks at the party and it's the little girl that comes downstairs and pees on the rug. Like it's a party. Right. Somebody was peeing on that rug, but not who you thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she she is combination of uh innocent little girl and does a really good job of the slow changes and the the minor changes and i kind of mentioned earlier but um like there's there's moments where they modulated her voice a little bit so it's not someone else's voice it's hers and they they like deepened it slightly and maybe she deepened it a little bit um and the way like how how she is to start the movie and then by the time we get to the doctor's offices how different she's acting like it was just a really good performance out of her at a time when you didn't get as many great performances out of really young actors it's tougher it, it's tough it's a lot easier now i feel like um to get a good performance out of kids um yeah but uh yeah she was just really really good and um I, I think deserving of the praise that she got for sure. Everybody was in this. Well, but. I'm I'm pretty sure, you know, when they were injecting the dye for the CT scan or whatever that scary machine was supposed to be. Uh, I, welcome to uh, early 70s medical technology. Right. But uh, I'm pretty sure they weren't actually uh, injecting a, a, a needle into her jugular vein. Mm-hmm. But the expressions on her face were yeah. very much as if, you know, she was being subjected to that. So, <clears throat> oh, and here's a here's an interesting little uh, tidbit about that particular scene. Um, so it's the uh, arteriogram, is what they called that. And there's the the assistant oh. to the doctor, the the guy with the beard. That's the assistant. He was an X-ray tech at uh, NYU Medical. Um, which is where they shot that. So they shot it at NYU. And okay. he worked there, got in as a small part just to be, you know, assistant there. In 1979, he was convicted of the murder of a film critic and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. <laughs> uh, while in prison, he bragged about and was the subject uh, in the murder of six other guys um, that he picked up in gay bars and then would murder them and dismember them. He talked about this in prison. And that was later turned into a movie, also directed by William Friedkin, called Cruisin with Al Pacino, was based on hmm. the story of that guy. And here he is in The Exorcist. <laughs> and like nine, six years later, he's convicted and sent to jail for murder. Well, there were rumors of an exorcist curse. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there, uh, there were. I mean... But Von, Von Cito lived until not that long ago, and he was in his 90s when mm-hmm. he died. So. Yeah, even and, uh, uh, Friedkin just died uh, in October of last year. <clears throat> uh, he was yeah. 87. So, so, yeah, I suspect it's just that uh, in any semi-large group of people, you're going to find some wackos. Oh, sure. 
And, you know, a movie like The Exorcist, you play up stuff like that because it's good marketing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I just found that really interesting that an actual uh, convicted murderer is in the movie. And, uh, but, you know, as just like a well, he, dude, wa- he wasn't yet, but he yeah. wasn't yet, uh, but he became yeah. one. <laughs> Um, oh, and I forgot to mention this. So William Peter Blatty wrote the book and he wrote the screenplay. He was not known as a horror author or, uh, or anything prior to The Exorcist. He was a comedy writer. He wrote uh, A Shot in the Dark in 1964. Hmm. That was his screenplay. Like that was the kind of stuff he did. Was, uh, was that Peter Sellers? Yeah. No, that, yep. that was an Inspector Clouseau movie, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he did yeah, this. I saw, I saw that one in the theaters when it first came out. So I, I said, I didn't see too many movies, but uh, apparently I did. <laughs> but yeah, I got a kick. I've always got a, gotten a kick out of Inspector Clouseau. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, and Peter Sellers is great. Peter Sellers. Yeah. Peter, Peter Sellers was a treasure. Um, but it was funny cause, uh, William Peter Blatty said that, uh, the exorcist ruined his comedy writing career, basically ended that. Uh, he was, he was just known as the guy that wrote the exorcist after this movie. Um, and he did go on to, uh, actually write and direct The Exorcist 3. Um, he wrote a novel called Legion, and then that got made into a movie, and he directed it uh, and wrote the screenplay. And that brought back um, Lieutenant Kinderman, only Lee J. Cobb couldn't reprise the role because he had passed away, so it was George C. Scott that played him. And it's mm. got um, Jason Miller back. Well, okay. Yeah, well, well, that's why I stopped the movie and brought up IMDb because I, my first thought was, is, is that George C. Scott? And then, oh, oh no, Lee J. Cobb. Okay, it's about about the same same time. So yeah. And then uh, George C. Scott actually went on to play juror number three in the re- in the television remake of Twelve Angry Men, who was the juror that Lee Cobb mm-hmm. played in the original movie, um, which that TV movie was directed by. William Friedkin. So Hmm. it all comes back together. Well, I, you know, I, I have seen the first 12 angry men, um, which, uh, I didn't see it when it first came out, but I, I did watch it, you know, on one of the streaming services, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just recently, I think within the last year, saw that for the first time. Um, and boy, that was a movie that, exceeded the hype that I had heard about it. And all I had heard was how it's one of the best movies ever made and all of this. And I watched it and I was like, you people undersold it. <laughs> I couldn't believe how good that movie was. Well, earlier we were talking about how it, it took a long time to develop this. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned David Lynch. Yeah. And the thing is, I, I love Twin Peaks and uh, the the movie or movies that went with it. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, yeah, it took a while to develop, but I, I was just thinking, I think the music had something to do with it. There wasn't that much music in this. Yeah. The tubular bells just showed up every now and then, but uh, it, uh, it was mostly, there wasn't a whole lot of musical background. And that feels very much the product of its time, right? That's that 70s um, kind of uh, new wave cinema that was going on um, of everything at that point had kind of stripped down um, and you were getting stuff that wasn't shot on lavish sound stages and inside the studios, they were going out in the streets and filming. They were, it's French connection, right? French connection is out on the streets of New York and, and you were also getting a lot less production. So, and music was the big one. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of movies from this era that would do that. You would have these long stretches with no music and it's just the diegetic sound, which, I mean, they did an amazing job with the sound work in this. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. The, the Foley work was really good. Yeah. So, and the, uh, but then, so it was, it was no country for old men, kind of a callback to that area then era then, because I feel like it, no yeah. music in that. Yeah, yeah, which is funny because it was literally two thirds of the way through that movie before I realized I haven't heard a single note of music, and I think it was. At I the watched scene... the entire. I, I watched the entire movie without realizing there wasn't any movie music in it. And it was months later that somebody mentioned in a podcast that yeah, there was no <laughs> no music in the movie. And I'm going, oh, maybe that's why it had such a weird mood to it. So mm-hmm. it's it's really interesting. Yeah, I know how this is not that. the note. 
not this is not the no country for old men uh uh episode but uh yeah that that one got to me because people that you thought you know they had it all together and uh, mm-hmm. they were going to get away with everything they didn't nope. so no yep. uh when you learn that that was a Cormac McCarthy novel um yeah it's like okay now it makes Not sense surprising. now now i get it um but uh oh so a couple of the famous things in this movie are the head spinning where yeah. her head goes 360 um, which was a so uh, why was she still alive when the demon left her? Because <laughs> <laughs> that would have done a lot of damage, right? Um, and that was uh, that was a dummy they they rigged up. What's great is the behind the scenes photos of seeing Linda Blair sitting in her her chair, all made up mm-hmm. next to that dummy with her face. It's just like, yeah. oh man, that's got to be so bizarre to to have that. Yeah. Um, and then the proje- projectile vomiting that she does um, of the pea soup. It was thick pea soup that they used. And uh, that first time it happens when she nails Father Karras, that mm-hmm. was a mistake. It was supposed to hit him in the chest. And instead, uh. it fired out a little little more than they thought. Because I think what they had was like a big hose kind of tube. And right. they would push a plunger. And they must have just done it a little too much and it hit him in the face. And they're like, that's what we're going to use. So that, again, real reaction. To getting hit in the face with pea yeah. soup. Yeah, well, I heard, I think it was probably on the Film Sack episode, that uh, the the Campbell split pea soup wasn't thick enough. Right. So they used and- Anderson split pea soup, and the Film Sack people didn't know what that was. I live in Southern California. I've been through Solvang many, many times. Ah. I know what Anderson split pea soup is. <laughs> you start seeing billboards with ads for Anderson's uh, about 150 miles before you get to Solvang if you're going up the 101. So, Excellent. all right. So... Oh, also, uh, and I found this one really interesting. I think I've mentioned this. I want to say I maybe mentioned this on the Gore episode when we talked about this, but Stanley Kubrick was somebody that the studio wanted to make this movie. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, he ended up obviously not doing it, but uh, he was impressed by it. I think that would have been a very, I mean, it would have been a very different movie in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah, no. But part of me kind of wants to see his version too. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, uh, yeah, he has a particular way of doing things. So. He does. He does, and you. It does make you wonder how much of what he might have done with the Exorcist ended up in The Shining. Because again, he's that same well, era of long takes and long moments that just sit. Uh, so he kind of would have fit this, but it's interesting. Interesting to think about. Well, they, uh, um, this director used a few kind of Hitchcockian tropes too. Like mm-hmm. you'd, you'd see, now I want to give credit where credit's due here. I, I heard this on the film sack episode about this movie, but he, uh, he uses, uh, um, you'll see people talking through a window and the camera just pushes in mm-hmm. through the window. And I, I didn't realize it at the time. It, the, the, the technique looked familiar to me, but, uh, but yeah, that's a very Hitchcockian thing to do. Yeah. He even had like a straight up Hitchcockian shot when the, um, psychiatrist who puts Reagan under, uh, hypnosis mm-hmm. when he falls back, that's, that's the Arbogast shot from psycho. If you've ever seen psycho when, when uh, Arbogast falls down the stairs, it's a very similar type of shot to that sort of. A, is, is that where is that where they're um, dollying the camera back while while uh, zooming in at the same time? No, is, that's is that the, the that's the push pull. That's like what they used in Jaws. Yeah. Um, right. This is yeah. this is where they lock the camera. Nowadays, you would do it with a uh, like a harness. Um, but basically, mm-hmm. you lock the camera dead onto the person, and then as they fall back, the camera's moving with them. So that shot where the psychiatrist, uh, when she reaches over and, as I said in my notes, gives him the Denver jock strap, and then he falls uh, backwards out of his chair, that's a very Hitchcock uh, shot because it just uh, follows him all the way to the floor. So, I must have blanked that one out of my mind. <laughs> 
I do really like that scene though, where she goes, she gets put under the hypnosis just because mm-hmm. again, I bought it. Like I bought that she was under, which right. for a 12 year old to pull that off convincingly, it's pretty impressive. Well, and, and that not only was she put under, she was possessed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and, the psychiatrist is just humoring her, humoring her by uh, say, saying to the uh, the demon that you know you're you're under hypnosis too, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, the demon's not going for it. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was pretty good acting. There's, uh, it was kind of like at the end of the movie All of Me, which is a really stupid movie but Lily Tomlin and, and Steve Martin, mm-hmm. I realized that it never occurred to me at one, once during that movie that Lily Tomlin had not taken over half of Steve Martin's body, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so, you know, may, maybe I'm really good at uh, suspending disbelief, but, uh, but yeah, while I was watching this, I, completely believe that she was possessed and under hypnosis so yeah and i mean that's the sign i think it was jimmy stewart said the best acting is when is uh, the best trick about acting don't get caught doing it and when you can when you can really dive into these roles and really make you believe that the person is who they are portraying and not just a character then it works and they all everybody did that like i really bought just kind of Ellen Burstyn's, she's just, she can't figure it out. She doesn't know what's going on. Chris has no idea what's happening and she wants right. to, to know, she wants to help her daughter, but she doesn't know what's going on. And the people that should know, don't know. And it's just frustrating her even more. Well, and yeah. And she, she does frustrate it really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and it's not just, it's not just angry acting. It's, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be right there with her because yeah. I have a, I have a daughter, 35, disabled, and uh, and we didn't get a decent diagnosis until she was in her early 30s. Mm. So, um, and uh, so she's been, uh, without going into too many details, she's been getting some treatments, which uh, uh, she she ha- she was having a lot of problems with chronic fatigue, and she still does, but she's doing a heck of a lot better now. Well, that's good. So, for, yeah. But we, it was really frustrating there for, for from the time she was about 14 until she was about 32, 33. We didn't know what the heck was going on. That's I can't imagine going through that. So, yeah. Um, oh, I also read that Jack Nicholson was up for the part of Father Karras. They're, again, very different. Yeah. And I love Jack. I don't know that he works for Father Karras. No. Um, I'm just trying to imagine. Because I'm trying it's to just imagine like Jack Nicholson can't can't help but being snide. It's, right. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, you, you can't handle the truth. Or, uh, um, I mean that that's that's what you love about him. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I just don't see him as Father Karras. I don't see him as a boxer even at, even back then. So no, I'm just trying he, to he's, envision. He's still a young. Yeah, I'm trying to envision his eyebrows as he's delivering some mm. of these lines and it just it does, doesn't work. He he looks too sinister, I think would be another word for it. Like, it, it's hard for me to picture him going through the kind of the emotional arc that Jason Miller does, who he's a broken man. When you, Especially those scenes where he's giving mass and we see yeah. him, he's just, he's just broken. He's down. He, he can't. Well, and it's hard, it's hard to be up on the, I would imagine to, you know, be up uh, at the altar and, uh, being, you know, the representative of God on earth, uh, when you're in the midst of a crisis of faith. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my crisis came when I was 13 years old and I just ran with it. So <laughs> been an agnostic ever since, but, uh, um, you know, but I mean, this, this guy's a true believer and, uh, it's gotta be tough. And speaking of being agnostic, I think that also helped this movie 
in that it doesn't it's agnostic towards uh the church in its in the way that it deals with everything yeah. it doesn't paint the church in kind of either light whether super great or super sinister it's very down the middle of like they're there they're doing what they can like father Karras is like i want to help i don't know how but i want to help and then when well chris chris wasn't religious she wasn't catholic right uh but i mean she was at the end of her ropes so mm -hmm. nothing else had worked and and things just kept getting worse so yeah why not Sure, and as she tells Father Karras, nothing you can do is going to make this worse. So why not? Let's just do it. Um, but I, I, I appreciated that part of it. Like, there's no ulterior motives. You don't get anything with the church. Like, oh, we're not, you know. you The church is reluctant to do an exorcism because right. it's just not something that is done. But when they talk to, when they finally talk to Father Karras, and I like, too, it's like, do you think this is going to make any difference? I don't know but nothing else has been. And then they're like, well, I mean, Father Mary uh, it, is around. It, it, it made me wonder, you know, when Father Karras took in, you know, a flask of tap water and splashed it uh, on a uh, little girl. What's her name? Anyway, Reagan. Yeah. Uh, Reagan. Splashed it on Reagan. And uh, was the demon just screwing with him? And he says, oh, it burns, it burns. Because he was seeing that as as evidence that she wasn't possessed mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that he was just using tap water. Yeah. And I think that again is a little bit of the carryover from the book of the, is she, isn't she? That's a little more like by that point in the movie, we're pretty convinced. Yeah. She is possessed. Um, we've seen enough kind of physical evidence of that, but I think in the book, because everything's a lot more subtle right? and they, they let that carry over. Um, so, you know, it, it works a bit. Uh, I may have to. I may have to add that book to my Kindle wish list at some point. Yeah, it'd be interesting. And it's it's suppose it's based on supposedly an actual event uh, that dealt with a young boy and possession, um, which it's murky how much of it really happened versus how much of it is kind of embellished. Um, but supposedly there was there was an actual uh, exorcism of some kind of a young boy, and that was what uh, influenced William Blatty to write that novel. Um, well, wasn't the Amityville Horror also supposed to be based on... Yes, that was, that was based on, um, on accounts of, of a real incident with uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren and the Lutz family and all of that. That one uh, has been talked about quite a bit, um, and it's always... You sort of... With those kinds of stories, I think the more you believe in the supernatural, the more you believe the based on true events part of the story. Um, and if you don't, then you dismiss whatever the, the actual story is. And I, I feel like, there, I don't know, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Like, I think some weird stuff happened, but we're never going to know enough to, to say definitively, but supposedly... This is based on something that really happened that then Blatty took and fictionalized and made into this story, um, which I think fed into some of that hysteria at the time. Plus, let's face it, there, no one had seen a movie like this in 1973. And then you get... No, I was, I was just looking. Amityville Horror came out in 77. You think this might have paved the way for it? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it did. And, 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 and then later on, Poltergeist? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Which, which I, I saw when it first came out, there was some superhero movie, one of the Superman movies I think we wanted to see, but it was sold out for the next four shows and Poltergeist was the next. And I went in knowing nothing about it and I was very sorry. About <laughs> the scene in the mirror where the guy's tearing his face off, just Whew, I almost yeah. walked out at that point. But that anyway, movie, that movie is I something. I keep going off onto other movies. Oh no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, what do you think, had you gone to see this in 1973, how do you think you would have reacted? Would you have been one of the people that really, that it affected a lot? Or do you think it would have just been something where you're like, I just don't like this? Well, in uh, uh, my apostasy from the Presbyterian church was very fresh in my mind. And I was feeling very, very much betrayed 
in those years okay. that uh, adults that I had trusted had been telling me things that they knew for certain that they couldn't possibly know. Uh, this is the way I was was seeing it, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I might have gotten yeah. You know, you know, an exorcism is obviously going to be done by a Catholic priest, but as you said, people didn't really know what exorcisms were back then. So mm -hmm. putting, putting my mind back in, uh, but yeah, I was very angry at, uh, um, organized religion still am actually. <laughs> just, sure. No, that's... Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the world that if it weren't for various organized religions, People still find a reason to kill each other, but at least they wouldn't be killing each other because their version of the book is slightly different than the, you know. But right. I digress. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I have a feeling as soon as I started seeing Catholic priests, I would have started getting very, very angry. That's fair. I can understand that, especially at that time. Um, it, I think also, so this movie is constantly touted as, you know, the scariest movie ever made and, and all this. And then you hear, I hear from people who see it for the first time, especially younger people. Um, where they'll watch it and they're like, that wasn't scary. That didn't scare me at all. Why is it called the scariest movie? Why was there all this hype? Why were people supposedly passing out in theaters and all that? But you have to put yourself back in that mindset of 1973, right? And people haven't seen anything right. like this. Movies, we don't have the 50 years of movies that have come out since this movie that have built upon it. And also, there was a lot, a very large, uh, I think a larger Catholic population. And a lot of those stories that you hear, were from cities, mm -hmm. right? New York, Chicago. You're going to have a lot more of a Catholic population in those major cities, especially then, than you do now. Um, and a lot more yeah. uh, people that are, are more religious. So that, I think, is a, a big part of it. Because um, I certainly know people that I have met in my life, even today, that if they saw this movie, it would affect them. Just by the way that they were raised, yeah. by the way that they view things. Um, it never had that effect no, on I me, but... I don't, uh, even if I'd seen it back then, I, I have no idea. I, I mean, that's a long time ago, uh, 50 years, but, uh, um, no, the scariest movie I was trying to think of that while you're talking, I, I think the scariest movie I ever saw was the first alien, which I saw in the theater and, uh, uh, that's a good just one with the chest bursters and, and, uh, and, you know, suspense of, you know, um, and I, it was unfortunate because I took a young lady, it was our first date and, uh, she glommed onto me at the beginning of the movie and did not let go of me until the end of the movie. And then she never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so not a good the, first date movie for the, for the two hours, the date went, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. I was, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, um, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that, that's, that's the kind of thing that scares me. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, and saw a documentary one time, the butterfly and the octopus, something like that. It, it was about a guy who had been in a car accident and he was in a coma and he was still conscious, mm -hmm. uh, to an extent, but he couldn't move. Oh yeah. And, oh. and how he was trying to, and that's, that's what scares me is being, you know, completely conscious in a body that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, no, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did capture a little uh, bit of audio from this movie. If you want to hear a couple of things, just, there's not a lot of like quips, you know, it's not a, it's not a clippy movie, but there's some moments that I thought were, were right. really kind of neat. Um, Early on, we spend a lot of time with Reagan and Chris and learning, you know, getting to know them and their kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. And they have a good relationship, which I, I do like. Um, they get along well. They don't fight, that kind of stuff, even though. Well, got... and, and who that has a beautiful horse is riding through a park and just lets some strange girl ride his horse around. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yeah, go ahead. Um, but I liked uh, little things like... Um, like uh, this one here, which is there. This is when she finds the Ouija board and she says, Wait a minute, you need to. No, you don't. I do it all the time. And there, right there, is your first indication that that things are going wrong for Reagan because she, I do this all the time. And so that's the movie's kind of shorthand way of being like, Yeah, she's in trouble. 
Um, well, and that's the first time you get uh, a little bit of telekinesis too, because yeah. uh, Chris takes takes the um, the thing from her, and it just shoots back to her hand. Yeah. Um, I mentioned. Let's see. Oh, um, when Ellen wakes up, or not Ellen? Uh, yeah, Ellen Burstyn wakes up in the middle of the night to the phone call, and then she turns over, and there's Reagan in the bed, and she's like, "What are you doing here?" My bed was shaking. I can't get to sleep. And like, we haven't seen that yet, but now again, well, was it really shaking? What is she dealing with? But then later on we see, oh no, that bed was shaking. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I also liked, I liked this one just because this is just a great line. This is a total mom line. Of course I like them. I like pizzas too, but I'm not going to marry one. Mm. I like pizzas too, but I'm not going to marry one. Um, well, it turns out the guy was uh, an Adam Henry. I'm not sure how, what your policy on cursing is. Uh, he wasn't great. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll say that. Uh, yes. Okay. So here is the, I mentioned this earlier, but um, the subtle things as they started to show the possession physically. Um the first kind of anything really showing that off is she's in the doctor's office. The doctor's doing the little um, tuning fork type thing where he knocks that and says, can you feel any vibration? And they have this exchange. Can you feel this? I don't feel anything. And how her voice hmm. is just just slightly lower and more, more terse. Um, mm -hmm. I like that. That's that subtle stuff that like is starting you down the path where you're not even... You, it doesn't register necessarily at first that she, that her voice is really any yeah, but different. She's, she's a lot more hostile than she has been up until that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and of course they go with uh, the ADHD type diagnosis or ADD or hyperactivity at the time. Um, and so they give her Ritalin because that was what you gave her. That's what you gave kids back then. Um, yeah. And, to, I mean, Chris, not knowing what's going on, she's going to listen to the doctor. And so when Reagan says something to her, she just says, You just take your pills and you'll be fine, really. You kind of can't fault her for that. Like, she doesn't know what's going on. That's the best advice she's gotten so far. Yep. Well, and especially in the 70s. Uh, if you're wearing a white coat, you have a lot of authority. Mm -hmm. And people didn't ask a whole lot of questions back then. Nope. You just listen to the guy in the white coat smoking. He knows what he's talking mm -hmm. about. He knows health. He smokes two four packs a day. Four out of five doctors who smoke, <laughs> four out of five doctors who smoke prefer camels. I'm old enough to remember that ad. Oh, man. It's amazing to me that that was an advertisement. Uh, but, yeah, <clears throat> it was. I had an office um, mate that smoked camels at one point. That was not good. <sighs> anyway, go ahead. No, when, uh, when I had that bad habit, it was camels. It was. But I broke that habit. <laughs> I've been good. So, um, I did. So when the doctor, when there's that scene where they have all the doctors, uh, and, um, they're all sitting around the table and the one starts to talk mm -hmm. about exorcism and the possession. And, uh, I just liked Chris's reaction to that of, you're telling me that I should take my daughter to a witch doctor. She immediately went to witch doctor and I, I like mm -hmm. that. Um, it was just a good line. And I will tell you, 24-year-old uh, me would have liked that, too, <laughs> referring to a Catholic, Catholic priest as a witch doctor. Um, yep. Now, we mentioned Tubular Bells. It's like the song from this, and I just caught a little bit of it because it's just good. It's, it's right up there. Like, that had to have influenced John Carpenter when he started messing around for the 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 score to Halloween, right? Tubular Bells had to have been some influence mm -hmm. on him there because it's such a simple little melody, but it's very haunting and ominous. And no, I had that fits. album. And I had that album, and it, it was one side was one whole song, the other side was one whole song. So if I was going to be reading or something like that, uh, where I didn't want to be distracted, I'd put it on. Oh, that's perfect. Um, a couple around, based around Father Karras. Uh, I did like the the guy in the subway who just 
And funny thing is, his IMDb page, this actor, he is in one movie, and it is this, and his IMDb photo is from this scene. And it was just the guy that says, Father, could you help an old altar boy? I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic. And that guy... Actually, I think later on in the movie, that's reprised... Oh, uh, the voice. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Reagan, I think, uses the voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Yep. Uh, but yeah, I just, I liked that. Um, again, we talked about how Kinderman would sort of dance around stuff with people. And when he first meets Father mm-hmm. Karras, you know, he tells him he looks like a boxer and he mentions a boxer. Um, he mentions an actor who was a boxer. And uh, and then you get this coming back to him. Do people tell you you look like Paul Newman? Always. <laughs> Do people tell you, <laughs> you look like Paul Newman? Um, and again, it's that dancing around, like how he would mention a movie. He would ask somebody, you know, ask one of them to go to a movie, and then he would just give the most, like, out there movie, Othello with Groucho Marx as Othello. And uh, and I love I loved how they would always say, "No, nah, I've seen that." I actually would have I would have liked to have seen that. I would have. I'd, I'd watch that. <laughs> Um, again, this is where you've got, so Father Karras comes into things partway through, uh, in terms of like the story with Reagan, right? Reagan's been going through all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I loved this when he's talking to Chris. Now, if you've seen as many psychotics as I have, you'd realize that's the same thing as saying you're Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, for him, that makes perfect. That's completely logical. Like he's seen enough people and and then not only that but having his mother who's clearly got dementia of some sort as well on top right. of like her injury because she had the, the injured leg but she's also like right. things are things are slipping for her and he's dealing with that um, right. as well so well, and chris's first interaction well not really an interaction with him but uh she hears him talking to uh the other another priest oh right as she's walking by uh, and she hears him saying he's he thinks he's losing his face fate. But, yep, yeah. yeah. Faith um, is the word I'm looking for. So here is uh, this is the amazing Mercedes McCambridge. Uh, it's the only line of hers that I that I got. But doing that voice, which definitely powered by Marlboro, you know that. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Like little math question: How many cigarettes would you have to smoke to get a voice that sounds like that? <laughs> Yeah, I would you have guess to be pounding lot. down whiskey sours at the same time. Yeah, um, but man, it's a perfect voice because it is just chilling. The voice my, my great aunt Joyce had my great aunt Joyce had a voice very similar to that, and uh, she was a heavy smoker and drinker. So nicest person on the planet. But, but yeah, just the sound that sound, and to yeah. hear to hear that voice coming out of you know. Linda Blair in the movie. It's such a great mixture and it works so well to just put you on ease. Um, and finally, this was the last clip I got and this is Father Marin. And I just, I just like this line and I, I, for, I, I don't know how I forgot about it, but it's Chris offers him some, uh, I think bourbon for whatever he's got in his flask or is he's drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and just his response is great. Well, the doctors say I shouldn't, but thank God, my will is weak. <laughs> my will is weak. Uh, if if anything, this movie suffered from not enough Max von Sydow. For for oh, as important yeah. as oh. his role is, he he just isn't in it enough. Well, I'd pretty much watch Max von Sydow reading the phone book. That's true. If he can find a phone book these days, right? Reading the dictionary, <laughs> but. Uh, um, yeah, I, he's one of my favorite actors. Uh, his, his, his understated comedy in Strange Brew mm, is mm. just perfect. He, uh, what, what, are, what are my all time favorite movies? Strange Brew. So he is, he is fantastic. He's fantastic in this. He does so much in the opening of this movie without saying yeah. anything. There's so much. Well, I was a little concerned. I was a little concerned when he went 
walking out of that dig, there was a guy right next to him whacking away at the wall with a, <laughs> with, with, with a, uh, with a pick. And I was afraid he was going to lose an arm. But, uh, it's true. And it was long about that time. I was thinking, this guy looks familiar. I, it, who was that? So I'll look it up after the end of the movie. And then I finally realized who he was. Who's that old guy that looks vaguely like Max von Sydow? Yeah. Um, yeah. He's, he just, he, there's so much, in him in his and and to act under that makeup too is yeah. always difficult and he does such a great job of just showing all of that emotion in those opening scenes and then um so the version you saw probably then did not have there's another moment that that got cut that Blatty really wanted to put back in and it's it's Marin and Karis having a discussion about why the demon possessed a child yeah, that wasn't in there. Okay. If you can find that, yeah. watch that, because it's a great exchange between the two of them because it's it's Father Marin basically kind of doubling down a little bit. There's there's the moment where they're going in, and he's like, look, demon's going to lie. It's going to tell you all sorts of lies. Don't listen to it, that kind of stuff. Um, but then they, they get talking about uh, Father Karras is like, why? Why would it go after you know a little girl? And Marin um, kind of explaining to him, like, it's because she's innocent and to to tear us down to bring us down kind of thing it's a really good exchange and i think that was the thing to add into the movie that gave it a little more emotional weight because we get that just that moment between the two of them that i think got cut for pacing more than anything but uh should have left that and in yet and it was still two hours some, long <laughs> yeah yeah um also was- max von Sydow playing father Marin. uh later on there was an exorcist prequel um, that came out in the early 2000s where Father Marin was played by Stellan Skarsgård. So it was nice to see another great actor uh, from, I believe they're they're both Swedish, right? And uh, uh, of two generations playing that same character. Yeah. It's pretty pretty incredible. The movie's not great, yeah. but Stellan Skarsgård is always good. He's another one of those I'll just watch in anything. I was just on the whole my will is weak thing. There, there was a, I think it was Catholic religious philosopher who liked to drink and gamble and have sex. And he had a prayer that Lord give me strength, but not, not just yet. <laughs> so, but I, I was trying to quickly look it up, but I can't find it. So that's a pretty good one though. Uh, that, that sounds a little, yeah. a little father Marinish. Um, I, yeah. I will say, even if you're not a horror fan, I do feel like this is a pretty pretty good movie overall to watch. I think, do you think had it been, had they maybe trimmed and gotten going a little quicker that you might have enjoyed it a bit more? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, all the clips that you see, you know, I've been seeing almost my whole life. Mm-hmm. Those are all, you know, just, you know, what once the possession is well underway and uh, she's... Uh, um, you know, spitting out uh, pea soup and mm-hmm. uh, um, and and all of that stuff. Um, and so I was expecting a lot more of that. Uh, and it's nice it's nice to have the backstory, but it just seems to me they could they could have trimmed a little bit out. Yeah, and again, I completely understand that. I think I think part of it too is you've got you know fifty years of talking about this movie and that is what gets talked about you always everything that right. gets talked about with this movie is the possession part at the end right and that's a quarter of the movie um yeah so now there was a uh, a recent sequel ish reimagining um called the exorcist believer which wasn't that great um i mean it was it was well produced but i if it missed the emotional part of things. I feel like it just part of what makes this movie work for me is, is that building of the relationship as she's getting possessed. Um, I do think you could, you could trim some of that a little bit and get there a little Mm -hmm. bit quicker. But what happens is a lot of times movies, especially like exorcist believer spent almost too little time establishing who the characters were before we get to, that point 
I think if you go, if you take this movie, you trim about a half an hour out. So that last half hour is the possession. That last third, mm-hmm. well, now we've gotten there 20 minutes faster. And you can kind of get to that, uh, I think, a little bit more. But we still spent enough time learning who Reagan and her mom were and how they got along. Like, you could cut out maybe one round of doctor visits because there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, leave, leave it in when uh, she's in the big conference room at the big table and she gets mm-hmm. so frustrated. But uh, Oh, sure. Uh, um, and uh, refers, you know, to the priest as a witch doctor. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it just could have, I just think it could have been better paced, but again, it was a different time. It was, that, yeah. that was back. Uh, that's the way things, as, as I said, I've pulled up old episodes of Rockford files and I've actually commented to my wife in the middle of them. Whoa, the pacing's a lot slower in these <laughs> things than they were. It was like, uh, it, this could have been a half hour show. Mm-hmm. And it was like they had a half hour worth of script and they needed to pad it out to an hour. So <laughs> like we paid for the car. We're going to show the car. Yep. Um, excellent. Well, Gary, I'm so glad you came on to, to talk about this movie. Uh, this was a lot of fun. It was, uh, it was nice when you reached out and you're like, Hey, I've never seen the exorcist. You know, my, my radar immediately goes off and it's like, well, <laughs> let's fix that. Uh, and I'm glad that you got to see it, even if it wasn't quite your cup of tea. Like, mm. you can check that off the list now. You can tell people I've seen The Exorcist. Is I? Yeah, yeah. Now, now I need to figure out how to see Oppenheimer. So yeah, <clears throat> that should be. It was on HBO. For, well, it was on HBO for about ten minutes. I think it's on Peacock at the moment, but currently mm-hmm. I I don't have Peacock. Uh, retired on a fixed income, and so we're uh, we're only. We're limiting the number of streaming services that we. Uh, um, I mean, that's fair. Rent at any one times. So. Yeah, there's so many yeah. of them now too that it's it's hard to keep up. Um, but it'll hit one, and you'll get to watch well, I, that because it's worth it. Yeah, I, I recently subscribed to Paramount Plus so I can catch up with all the Star Trek stuff that I have missed. No, oh, pretty much caught up with Star Wars. I still have Disney Plus. Excellent. Anyhow, uh, so, so well, well, thanks for having me on. And uh, um, yeah, if anybody wants to, uh, I, I have a little uh, Substack newsletter. Uh, it's called Diary of a Senior Geek. And people ask me what it's about. And I just say, it's my diary. It's whatever the hell I feel like talking about that particular week. And I have actually found that quite often I will sit down to write one column and wind up writing something else entirely. Uh, the other thing I was doing is I had a podcast uh, that started off, the name was uh, uh, Adventures in Social Anxiety, and I changed its name to Diary of a Senior Geek about four or five years ago. And uh, it was very early in my recording uh, journey. Mm-hmm. And so I've been taking some of the old episodes and recutting them, re-editing them, uh, cleaning up the audio, and adding a music bed. So, and those are all stories from my life. Very nice. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to skip all the ones complaining how Trump was uh, not handling COVID. Uh, but uh, I'm still on the stories of my life right now. So, anybody interested in that, just uh, seniorgeek at substack.com. Excellent. Seniorgeek.substack.com. Check that out. I subscribe to the free newsletter. Uh, so, I get those. Um, and it's great. I, I like that. And thank you so much for being here. This was super fun. We'll do this again sometime. We'll find another one. Maybe you haven't seen, or, you know, maybe there's uh, something there's, you love that I haven't seen. Who knows? There are a bunch of classic movies out there that I have not yet seen. So, uh, Excellent. I'm sure we can find something. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Travis. Thank you. And if you enjoy this show, you can check it out. Uh, I record live on Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern time at twitch.tv slash TV's Travis. And you can also check it out as a podcast. Anywhere you get your podcast comes out on Wednesdays. This is the 260th episode. I've been doing this show now for five years. Um, and uh, I never, when I started, I didn't think I would get to one year. And now I'm at year five and going strong. So thank you to everybody who listens. I uh, appreciate it all. If you want to check out uh, other things that I do, you can go to tvstravis.com. And there, there's links for merchandise with my logo on it. There's also a Patreon if you want to join that. And there's links to all the shows that I do. Um, And you can find them all at tvstravis.com. Until next week, 
uh, actually a, in about a week and a half because I will be out of town next week. But um, Jason from the Esoterica Cinema podcast is coming back and we're going to talk about uh, another a movie that I haven't seen um, and yet I've wanted to and it's called Upgrade. And uh, I can't wait because this came out in 2018 um, and it looked really interesting to me. It's uh, It came out really close to when Venom came out and it's kind of a similar idea. Some guy gets, uh, it's a sci-fi kind of horror uh, in a way or sort of sort of action sci-fi. You get some kind of augmentations. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about it. I remember the trailer and just never got around to seeing it. So uh, Jason Peters from the Esoterica Cinema is going to come back and he's going to make me watch it. So that is the next episode, uh, which we'll be recording on a Wednesday. So keep an eye on the social medias and on the website, and I will make sure you know when that is happening as well. But uh, Gary, thank you so much for being here. This has been just a blast. We're definitely going to do this again sometime. Uh, you're, you're very welcome. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I will be, maybe I'll send you a list of movies I haven't seen, and we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. That sounds great. And until next time, just remember to enjoy your movies, regardless of what they are. And uh, let's be excellent to each other. In my I beg your pardon? Never seen it before in my life. Have you? I don't know why. That was just so... That was Burke. I mean, what an asshole. <laughs> yep, pretty much.